as loans are defaulted upon, as mortgages are uh, defaulted upon and for houses foreclosed, uh, as investments go sour, as real estate prices decline, in effect, money is disappearing from the economy. We are in a deflationary spiral at the moment. Now, whether, how long that will continue is uh, an open question. We could very well find ourselves in a state of hyperinflation within just a few months as, as governments, not only the U.S. government, but the, the EU, the U.K., and others uh, borrow much more money to exist, into existence in order to fight these economic fires. But again, this is the kind of economic fallout that we are likely to see increasingly from spiraling resource prices that we have not factored into any of our economic models. Our economic models are for stable resource costs and continued economic growth. When resources increase in price and economic growth stalls, then the et entire economy goes into a tailspin and it looks like this. The thing to remember is that money is a claim on labor and resources in the final analysis. And if resources are becoming more scarce and the amount of money in circulation remains the same, that, then that means the money will lose value. We can print money, but we can't print energy. We can't print uh, topsoil or water. Well, could we continue to grow the total energy in the economy just by adding renewable sources of energy? It would be nice to think so, and I'm certainly not arguing against the development of renewable energy sources, quite the opposite. We should be developing renewables as quickly as possible to offset our dependence on fossil fuels. But the reality is that we are so dependent on fossil fuels that it is extremely unlikely that we'll be able to develop renewables fast enough to replace fossil fuels and maintain economic growth. So if that's true, if what I've just said is true, then it's possible that we have reached the limits to growth. That this is not something that's going to happen perhaps in the mid-21st century, but that we are living in that process right now. And as we watch the headlines go past on the financial pages of the world newspapers, uh, these are the symptoms. If that's true, over the next five years, we are likely to see more economic uh, fallout in the forms of uh, currency problems, values of currencies, bank failures, and these things will inevitably bring political fallout in many countries around the world. Think again of the situation in China. If China is unable to maintain 8% to 10% economic growth annually, then social political problems start to uh, come to the fore. Uh, China's been using rapid economic growth in order to forestall political problems, the, the division between the wealthy uh, coastal cities and the poor hinterland. Well, as long as there's rapid economic growth, there's the promise that uh, poorer members of the society will be able to enrich themselves as time goes on. There's the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, the carrot uh, dangling bef before them. But if the economy stalls out, then suddenly the enormous economic inequality that's been built up in the Chinese system over the past couple of decades becomes a real social problem and a political problem. That's just one country. Um, I could talk about the political problems in the U.S., but I don't want to bore you. Food systems are going to become stretched and stressed, again, because our food systems are so dependent on fossil fuels. Um, in industrial countries like the U.S. and Canada, we spend about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy in total, between 7 and 10 calories of fossil fuel energy, for every calorie of food that we produce. If you look at the food system in total, that's not just uh, tractor fuel and fertilizer, but also the transporting of uh, farm inputs and outputs, food storage, and so on. This is, this is a kind of food system that makes sense in the age of globalization with cheap fuel and cheap inputs. But in an age of, of expensive fossil fuels, an age when globalization is actually going in reverse as it has been for the past 18 months, 
uh, this kind of food system is, uh, is very perilous. And in fact, we, we've already seen the peak in per capita grain production several years ago. And as, as time goes on, that situation could become much, much worse. Over the next 40 years, of course, climate impacts become a, a much bigger factor than is likely to be the case over the next five years. Food shortages become uh, widespread famines. We're likely to see mass migrations of environmental and economic refugees. We will be living through the end of the fossil fuel era. That's not to say that by 2050, there will be no more oil or coal or natural gas. Certainly, there will be deposits of these fuels around, but our economies will certainly not be able to burn and use nearly the same amounts of these fuels as we're currently doing. So the question is, how will we manage the transition from where we are today, overwhelmingly fossil fuel dependent, growth dependent societies, to societies that are stable and secure, using non-renewable resources and using renewable resources at rates less than or equal to the rate of natural replenishment. I mean, this is the question of our generation and of our time. And our success as a species will hinge on how we answer those questions. There are, I think, four basic strategies for, for dealing with this transition ahead of us. One, top-down government policy. Uh, as we've been trying to achieve, for example, with climate change in Copenhagen, and now in 2010 we'll be trying again in Mexico City. So far it hasn't been going very well, unfortunately. Uh, we need to redouble our efforts because we absolutely need global, po global food policy, global climate policy, global soil policy, global water policy. But at the same time, if policy makers, if politicians are going to feel confident in making these tough choices ahead of them, and they, many of them are going to be difficult choices because they'll be going against the prevailing paradigm of unending economic growth. If they're going to be supported in that, they need a bottom-up grassroots upswelling of pressure on them to make those tough choices. We are going to need proactive planning for linear adaptation. We need to imagine where we want to be in 2050 in terms of our fossil fuel consumption, our water consumption, topsoil erosion, and so on, and then backcast from that desirable goal to where we are now with a series of measurable steps to get us there. That's an absolutely necessary process. But at the same time, the reality is that we can't count upon the next 40 years as being a sort of nice level playing field on which we can implement those incremental steps. The reality is that the next 40 years will be filled with potholes and explosions uh, as problems that we have ignored too long come to fruition, economic problems and environmental ecological problems. So we're going to have to be prepared to put out fires along the way. We're going to have to be prepared for crisis management, in other words, along with linear adapt adaptive planning. So the job of planners today, I would say more than anything else, is planning for discontinuity. And this is not what planners like to do. We like to forecast based on recent experience and simply extrapolate into the future recent trends of growth uh, for decades into the future. But is that realistic? We need to reduce the impacts of fossil fuel consumption and fossil fuel dependency and all of the other things that we're doing unsustainably as much as possible but we also have to prepare for impacts that are already on their way. That means building resilience into our societal systems. Resilience meaning the ability to absorb shocks, but continuing to function in the face of those shocks.